The fight over Jordan Child's bronze medal lives on even after the U.S. lost its most recent appeal. Ice Cube is not happy with FIBA, and Las Vegas police officers are threatening a boycott on working Raiders games. It's Wednesday, August 14th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Today, we're going to get the latest on the ongoing fight over Jordan Child's bronze medal with my colleague David Rumsey. His teammate on the FOS newsletter, Colin Salow, explains the beef between Ice Cube, FIBA, and even the NBA. Our breaking news reporter, Margaret Fleming, fills us in on why police could boycott working Las Vegas Raiders games. Also later, you'll get the answer to this trivia question, which NFL player is launching a mayonnaise-scented cologne? While you think about that one, let's hit some headlines. Although the Olympics have officially concluded, the saga unfolding around Jordan Child seems like it's just beginning. On Monday, the Court of Arbitration for Sports said that its ruling for Child to return the medal was final. USA Gymnastics responded with a statement on Twitter saying they were disappointed by the CAS decision and that they will continue to pursue every possible avenue and appeal process to allow Child to keep the medal and that they have video evidence to support their appeal. Specifically, USAG is saying that footage that was only recently made available to them shows that head coach Cecile Landy filed an appeal 47 seconds into the one minute time period allotted for that, not one minute and four seconds. Ice Cube said that the Netherlands, who won gold in Paris in three on three basketball, accepted his offer to take on a team from his big three league, but FIBA blocked the Netherlands from participating. The rapper said FIBA is scared of the big three. More on both of those stories later. Kevin Durant has purchased a stake in Paris Saint-Germain, adding to his portfolio of sports investments that also includes the Philadelphia Union and Gotham City FC soccer clubs, plus a stake in a major league pickleball team, the Brooklyn Aces. Durant reportedly invested less than $10 million in PSG. The majority owner of the club is Cutter Sports. The NFL continues its process of integrating private equity investments for teams. This week, the league will begin meeting with financial firms to assess viable options. Arctos Partners, Carlisle, Blackstone, CBC, and Dynasty Equity are all named as expected suitors for this impending initiative. The NFL will be implementing facial recognition software in stadiums next year, an initiative that has been met with some opposition already. The latest critic is the Las Vegas Police Union President Steve Gramas, who told local officers to not work Raiders home games if the new tech is in place. He argues that the NFL will, quote, take your biometric data and that it could end up in the hands of people who are anti-cop that support a different agenda than what law and order supports. Graham has said attorneys for both parties are working together to find a solution. The Paris Olympics were a smashing success commercially, setting a slew of records for media and merchandising partners alike. On the viewership front, NBC reports a total audience delivery of 30.6 million, which is up 81% from the Tokyo Games. Meanwhile, on the merchandise side, Fanatics reports its best ever Olympic performance and logs a 200% increase in gear sales compared to the 2021 Games. Gold medals for everyone. Jordan Childs is still being asked to return her bronze medal after the U.S. lost an appeal to the Court of Arbitration for Sport regarding a disputed tenth of a point in her Olympic gymnastics routine. But this saga is far from over. My colleague David Rumsey has the details and he joins us next. Joining me now is front office sports newsletter writer, David Rumsey. Welcome, David. Great to be on, Owen. Always great to have you. So the latest in the Jordan Childs saga in which she's being asked to return her bronze medal in the gymnastics, uh, the court of arbitration for sport has denied the U.S.'s appeal um, around this whole thing. Uh, What does that mean for kind of where things go next here? It's not a great sign at all for Jordan Childs or USA Gymnastics, Team USA, et cetera. Obviously, in the grand scheme of things, the U.S. won the medal count by a lot, the overall medal count a lot in Paris. So this isn't going to impact that or anything. And this was a bronze medal, so it's not going to impact that tie for gold with China at 40 gold medals apiece. But I think it's really just the, the precedent of the U.S. really feels like Childs should won this medal and should keep it because of the, and not have to give it back because of this judging error that I think a lot of people have been doing a lot of reading on now. And they say they have video evidence and everything, but really the news here now is they're fighting an uphill battle because the court of arbitration for sport has said to the U S no, we're not accepting your appeal to our appeal of this other appeal. And all the U S can do now is go to the Swiss Supreme court to try to challenge the decision from the court of arbitration for sports. So lots of lawyers, lots of uh, court dates probably coming up in this case. Yeah. So this is something I 
just learned is that, yeah, the ultimate entity in deciding whether or not Jordan Childs gets that point one of points back in her um, for her gymnastics routine is the actual Supreme Court of Switzerland. Um, do we expect the U.S. to to take it there at this point? They say they will. They said they'll um, use every avenue that they can, to, including in, the, in their statement, USA Gymnastics said, you know, they specifically mentioned this Swiss Supreme Court, which governs this court of arbitration for sport, which is based in Switzerland. And that's how all of this uh, is being governed in Switzerland after Team USA and Romania were fighting in France. There's still the question of whether Childs returns the physical medal. Do we have any sense of you know, precedent or, you know, what it would mean if she didn't or just like where things go from there? Yeah, I mean, typically medals have been returned a lot from Olympic Games throughout the years, but usually it's because somebody was caught doping. And after the fact, they tested positive and we realized that they shouldn't have won their race or their event or competition because they were not clean during that period of time. And typically, you know, sporting federations, unless they're really trying to fight that aspect of it, you know, get those athletes to give the medals back, those athletes get suspended, etc. But this is a completely different case because we're not talking about doping here or that Childs did anything wrong or that anybody from Romania did anything wrong. This is all due to what happened with the judges and them not um, giving her the proper allocation for difficulty on her routine. So nobody really, nobody, none of the athletes did anything wrong here. So nobody's getting in trouble, but obviously Childs feels like she won the bronze medal. So does, and she has the support of Team USA. Obviously the Romanian team feels like they're gymnasts won the bronze medal. So they would like to be acknowledged for that. And they really are, have the upper hand here. So yeah, it is if ultimately it, we get through all the court procedures and the U S has lost and there's literally nowhere else to go. It'll be interesting to see, do they say, Hey, no, keep that medal, Jordan, do not return it no matter what, or is the IOC going to step in and say, Hey, you really got to give that back or we're going to suspend you or you can't, uh, compete in this next event or, or whatever, because obviously they could let her keep the medal and give a new medal to Romania and uh, say, okay, officially in the record books, um, you know, the U S finished fifth and Romanian gymnasts finished third. Right. Um, and, but you know, then Childs and team USA could say, well, we still have the medal here and it's just kind of like a, a fight forever. It, it just not in the record books, but maybe that would be too much of a bad look uh, to, to keep that if the court appeal doesn't go the way for the U.S. Yeah, I mean, they have a, a precedent to uphold and they don't want it, everyone to just like hang on to their medals anytime they say like, well, I think I should have won. So, uh, you know, once once the medal's in my hand, it's mine. Um, you could see how this sort of gets slippery slopey um, at the same time. Like, do they want a big public fight with the U.S.? when the U.S. is hosting the 2028 Olympics. Of course. So, uh, yeah, um, any, anything that you're kind of like, you know, um, uh, just sort of watching for in terms of like how, how that falls one way or another? Yeah, I think it's really about the public messaging. So far, uh, USA Gymnastics has really been taking this out of Jordan Child's hands so she doesn't have to continue to release statements or do any things like that. So I think that's great that, you know, they're taking it up to the, you know, higher levels and they're fighting this fight for her um, as they should, really. And and now it's going to be, if they keep losing these court battles, the U.S., are they going to get more defensive and more demonstrative and, um, you know, really stand their ground? Or are they eventually going to say, hey, we think this is wrong, but we're going to give it back, give the medal back, and we're going to do something else to honor Jordan. Maybe they go that route, take the high road. Um, but who knows? If they feel like there's not going to be any lasting ramifications, maybe they do dig their feet in and say, nope, uh, keep, we're keeping this medal and you're not going to do anything to us. And that could set up, um, you know, something come 2028 or maybe at the next world championships uh, for gymnastics, if there's some bad blood uh, potentially, or if people feel like uh, the U S is, you know, really in the wrong here going for this bronze medal after, you know, team USA did win the all around um, team competition uh, at the Paris Olympics and a cup, you know, Simone Biles won a gold, et cetera. So it's not like the U.S. is lacking for medals in gymnastics here. And I just have to wonder, I mean, some like Olympic historian can correct me here, but I like this has to be possibly the most like disputed point one points in a routine in, like, so. in history. Uh, David yeah. Rumsey, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you, Owen.
The Big Three Basketball League, owned by rapper Ice Cube, wanted its stars representing the U.S. in Olympic three-on-three competitions. Then it wanted its all-stars to face off against the gold medal winning team. It was denied on both fronts, and Cube is taking it personally. Our reporter, Colin Salo, takes us into that story next. Joining me now is Front Office Sports newsletter reporter, Colin Salow. Welcome, Colin. Hey, Owen. What's up? Hey, great to have you on. So FIBA has blocked the Netherlands gold-winning three-on-three basketball team from competing against a set of all-stars from Ice Cube's Big Three League. Um, Why did they do this? Essentially, the Netherlands said yes to the challenge of the Big Three. But it's important to look at the timeline here. The Netherlands won on August 5th. And the game was scheduled for August 18. So that's less than two weeks. And what FIBA told the Netherlands in a letter was, in your entry form, when you signed up to play for 3x3 and for for, uh, under FIBA, if you are going to play in a non-sanctioned FIBA event, you must ask and get permission three weeks in advance of that non-sanctioned FIBA event. So they pointed out, you know, there was all this, you know, annex this, article this on the entry form. And that's and they said we're denying your request because you know it's less than two weeks out. Ice Cube is not saying, "Oh darn, we missed the deadline." He's saying FIBA's scared of us. Anything that uh, kind of backs up that sentiment? I mean, Ice Cube has has made his claims, um, and I think also their president Jeff Quatinets has told us that he they think that there is something um, going on with the powers that be, with politics, whether it's FIBA, whether it's USA Basketball not having the big three players uh, on the team. Um, you know, it's their experience. They've, you know, they've, they've talked about how there's a sponsorship thing. They've mentioned Jalen Brown even and what's going on between Jalen Brown and USA Basketball saying there's politics involved. And personally, there are politics in, in all of these situations. And, you know, perhaps with some parts of it, there are politics. I think in this case, FIBA was like, hey, these are the rules. You got to abide by them. On the From the big three's perspective, what I don't you know have, have enough knowledge to really know is, are they being actively blocked here or just more ignored by, you know, in this case, by FIBA? I mean, not ignored because FIBA had to handle the request, but, you know, the big three said, you know, the NBA is trying to, you know, get in our way. FIBA doesn't doesn't want to have, have anything to do with us. Or are they just saying that, you know, we, we've got other things to deal with here. Like, you know, just because you exist doesn't mean we have to like make a big deal out of you. Yeah. I think it's, it's honestly separate situations, but then FIBA um, big three is trying to make it seem like it is one and it maybe it is one, but w- when it comes to big three and not making the USA basketball team, that's one situation in and of itself where they're saying, Hey, why aren't we on, why aren't you getting our players to, to get on this three X three basketball team so we can win gold in the, in the Olympics. And then now they're like, okay, the three X three basketball team did so poorly in the Olympics. Let's challenge the gold medal winners because it's kind of a, a way to prove that big three is better. And FIBA is saying, Hey, no, you can't because of this rule. And so now the big three is like, well, you didn't allow us to play in USA basketball, which by the way is there are restrictions for why the big three is not big three players are not on the three X three basketball team. You can argue whether those restrictions are too strict. Big three is saying they are. Um, but in that case, because they believe they're being blocked, now um, when they're challenging this Netherlands team, which doesn't involve you know FIBA or whatever, doesn't need to involve them, they're saying, oh, there's this theory again where they're they're continuing to stop us. You know, they're, they're connected, but at the same time, they, they there are different rules for different situations. So it sounds like Big Three is doesn't have anything currently in the works to you know you know, do another game three weeks out or, or, you know, I don't know, challenge some NBA players or something. Um, do, do we kind of know, like, if, if they've got anything else in the works here? Yeah, I mean, they, they can't, ch- it doesn't seem like they can do it now simply because the 18th, which is the game that they were going to supposed to play, was the championship game, their all-star game. It was scheduled already with CBS. So I don't think they're able to, you know, create that same platform to have this different game with the Netherlands, right? Um, that would get the same amount of distribution. Um, from what I know, it seems like they're open to the opportunity of doing it again, but because this is basically the end of their season, um, it's not something that they can definitively say right now. What's your sense of just 
big three's place in, in the basketball world. I mean, it's still a young league. You know, it's too soon, I think, to say, like, they are like this compared to the NBA or like this compared to like the three on three world internationally. Um, but do, do they have like a, a real presence or I mean, is is or is because like they've got a lot of talk coming. Um, uh, is it can they back up back that up? You know, they have been getting some investment, um, I believe. Uh, someone's bought a team for them in, in LA and Miami. So it's interesting to see that there are investments. But to your point, it, it is it is quite odd because you don't hear them beyond, you know, the Caitlin Clark um, offer, beyond this Netherlands offer. I, I personally see that they have maybe some form of like um, like following, whether they're making money or not, or whether it's something that's really, really sticking. Question, But again, young league, it's just a matter of, you know, how long are they going to have these investments going? Uh, because, you know, you look at an example, like, obviously this is very different, but like the WNBA where it took them, you know, 28 years to get to this point where they're finally in a good place. Uh, you know, the big three, I believe has only been around since 2017. So how it's just a matter of how long they're willing to ride this investment, I think. Yeah, definitely. And anything else you're kind of other dominoes you're looking to fall just, you know, on any part of this. Yeah, I think it's it. The, the big thing is really how because it Ice Cube and Jeff Quatnets, the their president, they they are very open and public in in calling out USA Basketball, calling out FIBA, um, and that's obviously not going to do uh, do any favors into the relationship for them to work. And and if it's going to work, if they're going to get big three players into the Olympics, which frankly is probably going to help the team perform better. Um, it, they're going to have to work together. So I think that's where I'm curious to see what happens. Because again, for them to join, for, for big three players to join USA Basketball, they have to play in sanctioned FIBA events, which will not pay them the way that big three does. And so they have to work together. And I'm curious to see if there's going to be some form of mitigation, of of a way to, to bridge that gap. And if not, then... Maybe we're just going to keep continuing to see this type of falling out between the two sides. Very interesting stuff. Colin Salo, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thank you, Owen. Will Levis is launching his new signature scent, Creamy Mayonnaise. Before he was drafted, Levis said that he put mayo in his coffee, which we think is a joke, or at least that's what he said after he joined the Tennessee Titans. But people don't forget, and certainly not Hellman's. Tuesday morning, the condiment giant announced the launch of Will Levis No. 8, Parfum de Mayonnaise, which they called the fragrance you've been craving. Further investigation revealed a fully functioning web landing page, which includes a full list of fragrance undertones featuring notes of mayonnaise accord, musk, and of course, coffee undertones that are reminiscent of Will's signature mayonnaise-infused brew. The perfume appears to be on sales for $8 per bottle, although it was sold out when we tried to buy it. Allegedly, the supply is restocked and available to order at 10 a.m. daily, if you're into that kind of thing. NFL stars are some of the best athletes in the world, so maybe that makes it a little more believable when they ask to compete against Olympic athletes. Tyreek Hill said on Monday that he could beat Noah Lyles in a race, and it looks like Micah Parsons wants a slice of Olympic action too. Following the closing ceremonies, the Cowboys defensive anchor tweeted, I need to find a way to get in the Olympics by 2028. What events y'all think I can do? Need ideas? Fans came in with a slew of suggestions, including bobsledding, flag football, and breakdancing. Some suggested sports that haven't been created yet, like running that mouth or fastest postseason collapse for our number one seed. Perhaps Parsons' efforts would be better focused on bringing the Cowboys to an NFC championship before he starts thinking about the 2028 Olympics. The Las Vegas Police Union is not thrilled with the NFL's new initiative on facial recognition and have raised the possibility of boycotting Raiders games if the policy becomes mandatory. Coming up, we get the details from our breaking news reporter, Margaret Fleming. I'm joined now by a front office sports breaking news reporter, Margaret Fleming. Welcome, Margaret. Thanks, Owen. Great to have you on. So the Las Vegas police are threatening to boycott working at Raiders game. What's the nature of their complaint here? So the NFL is moving a program piloted with six teams last year, and now it's moving it to every team um, for security heightened in certain parts of the stadium. So this is you know, going to be locker rooms on the field, media rooms, things like that. Um, and the program is meant to scan facial recognition. So if you take a photo, you submit a photo uh, to the system, then it will remember you and um, 
the whole point of this is for the NFL to um, kind of crack down on uh, credential issues. So like if, you know, you just hand off a credential to somebody or somebody gets, um, you know, hands on one or whatever it is, this is meant to kind of tighten up security. Um, and uh, one trade publication also wrote that it was used at the Super Bowl last year, which the Super Bowl was in Las Vegas. So I don't, it's unclear whether these um, same officers had to use it last year for the Super Bowl, but um, it's it's reportedly been something that's been in Vegas before. Um, so yeah, the, the police officers, the main um, kind of Metro Vegas uh, police officers union out there, their, uh, their head guy went on, uh, sent a video out that was obtained by TMZ and then TMZ published it um, and spoke with him and, um, they were saying that that um, they don't want the NFL to have access to um, their data, to their facial data, and then to be able to give it away. He read directly what the he, – he was saying this is the NFL's policy. He said the exact quote was the collection, use, retention, and disclosure of their data. And so that freaked him out and, and um, some of the other uh, police officers of saying um, – you know, you're allowed to have our data and do what you want with it. This might end up in the hands of somebody who's anti-cop. We don't know where this is going um, and who this, you know, our facial data might be shared with. Um, so uh, that's kind of the, the situation that's going on right now. They haven't boycotted any games yet. But um, again, their, their uh, president was saying that he would advise it in the future if this is something that is required. So uh, that would be bad for the Raiders uh, to not have any police officers. Uh, that would be a little bit of a pickle for them. Um, so, yes, yeah, so this is an interesting situation unfolding. Yeah. And so this, they're going to work the preseason games. And um, because it's this policy is currently not required. But if it is, then, yeah, they, they could up and end up with a situation where either they have to find some non-union security or or you know alternate security um or work out a deal here and yeah my understanding at least from the the quote from you know that union union leader steve Grammis, was he was less about like we want to be able to transfer um access and more like we don't know who this is going to end up in the hands of you know like once once you've got our faces then then you know the nfl works with a lot of different partners in various capacities and uh, maybe we trust the NFL, but we don't know. We don't necessarily trust everyone the NFL works with. Yeah, exactly. And and he told TMZ that the like both sides are working on something right now. Like a conclusion hasn't been reached yet. But um, it's a fair question. I mean, it, it's like this is a technology that's rapidly evolving, and and in different areas of our lives, um, for a lot of people, this is normal now on your phone with Face ID on your on your iPhone. But um, still, you know. Apple and the NFL are different entities. And so it's, it, uh, it, it's a fair question to be like, I don't know what the national football league wants to do with my face data, but, um, I mean, this could be the way that sports is going. We're seeing this outside of just internal security things we've seen. I mean, last year with the, the Phillies, uh, were debuting the MLB go ahead entry technology, um, which is about fans entering the stadium. So at certain gates, if you had, uh, a picture of your face in your MLB ballpark app, uh, it would just register you on the machines um, and allow you to go through with, it would immediately pop up like, you know, Owen Poindexter has, you know, four tickets and you could walk in um, with, you know, your three guests. And the whole point of that was kind of to, or a big reason that they said they wanted to do that was um, to speed up the process, of course, but also um, for like families and stuff, like if you're holding, you know, a couple kids or you got bags or whatever the situation is, like um, you, that you can just walk through and it, it, it really helps the process. And when you pair that with um, some some stadiums, some public spaces have that, um, that security technology that you just walk through, um, it's less of like dump your stuff and pick it up and whatever, or it's just kind of like a walk through security that they can scan you with the screen. If you pair that with that go ahead technology, you you really are just walking straight through, you know, that that can really speed up the time to get into a stadium. At the same time, it, it's facial recognition technology. The MLB said, you know, the picture's deleted right after, but um, but we're just, you know, seeing this new science pioneering in, in sports in different ways. And so um, it, it could very well be the future of the way that a lot of things operate in sports. Um, this could be a way that 
you know, people do it. I mean, NFL doing it this year in even just like a media room, like everyone at the stadium, everyone in, in media um, would very quickly be caught up to this um, and could very quickly see something like this being implemented with fans as well. So, um yeah, it, it's fair concerns being raised, I think. We saw an example of, of how that can, you know, how that can creep into other stuff with uh, James Dolan, the owner of the Knicks and the Las Vegas Sphere, among other properties, um, instituted a policy that, as far as I know, is still ongoing, where anyone working for a law firm connected to that, that, was, that is suing him in some capacity is suing MSG or MSG Entertainment, MSG Networks, um, is not allowed into any of his venues and that includes things like radio city music hall and and also madison square garden obviously and so yeah there are you know reports of you know someone like bringing in a, a bunch of of kids you know it's like their their kid and a bunch of their friends are like trying to go see a rangers game or something at msg and they're denied because they work for this law firm even if they're not the litigators involved in a case against msg um so yeah once once these the data and those privileges are, you know, in the hands of the owners. I mean, Dolan's kind of a unique figure, but um, you can see how it can quickly go beyond, you know, just like, oh, you've got a ticket, come on in. Um, you know, it could be like, you know, you were you were acting unruly last week, and now now like your face, and you know, now now you're just banned. Like we we hit the button, like we don't like you. So yeah, you could a hundred percent think of like okay, we know this person in section, you know, 112 was, you know, acting whatever, you know, and, you know, had too much beer at the game or whatever it was. And they can very quickly find who that person was and, and not allow their face or whatever, you know, and, and that could probably happen without the face stuff. But you can understand how that would take it to another level. But it's just that much easier in the same way. It's easier to walk in with the face stuff. It's just like, it's easier to be like, okay, who's that guy? Like, oh, like, even if you move seats, right? So like, you can, it's, it's just that much easier to be like, we've got their face. And, and now like, you can't come to the next game. So it'll be interesting to see where this all goes in, in sports. Um, I don't really know if I have a prediction for how this is going to turn out. I would think, um, I mean, he, he said that he, like the president of the police officers um, union in Vegas said he fears that um, they might just acquiesce to, to the league's demands. And so I feel like I could see it going that way um, where they just kind of have to let this happen. But um, I, I think it's probably good that they're raising some concerns in terms of, even if the NFL has the best of intentions, like we're saying, this might force um, some tightening of like consumer protections and what does this actually look like? Um, I don't know if any government regulation would really get involved at this point, but um, at some point the NFL, you know, will probably need to have some self-imposed or likely outside imposed restrictions about what can you do with faces. Margaret Fleming, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks for having me on. Before we go, here's Malika Andrews not missing a beat when a magnitude 4.4 earthquake shook ESPN studios in Los Angeles while she was interviewing Rebecca Lobo. ...had to representing the home country in these Olympics. And it was so much fun to see, particularly the crowd sort of getting behind as we have a bit of an earthquake here in Los Angeles. So we're just going to make sure that our studio lights, everything stays safe, everything's shaking. You good, Mylan? Everybody good? All right, thank you so much for bearing with us through that. Our studio was shaking just a little bit. Tarsi, if you're still good in the studio and in the everyone's still good. Right. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, say hi on the social media platforms you enjoy or find me at Owen Poindexter. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.